Well, Peter Higgins, thank you very much for coming along. So far, um, so good. Yeah, just so what we're doing here, just for information, we're coming up with a, a series of videos which we're calling Absolute Reality, because the, the aim is to try and see if there is an absolute reality on certain issues that seem to be confused in many ways these oh, days. Okay. So project. that's the aim. And what I wanted to start talking to you about, if that's okay, and it's kind of topical today, but it's topical always, is a concept of, so you've got politics and you've got different people with different policies. And the aim is for those people who generally look at the policies and make their decisions. And the question would be, is there any point in looking at underlying ideologies? Do they matter anymore? And if they do matter, how important are they? Well, they matter enormously. And the, the problem is people <clears throat> don't realise how much they matter because they're unconscious of them, but they follow them while being unconscious of them. The old Maynard Keynes joke that yeah. any politician who said he had no dogma was invariably the slave of some defunct economist uh, is true. And it's it particularly noticeable in modern so-called conservative politicians mm. in this country who've now adopted almost entirely what they don't realize is the philosophy of Eurocommunism. It's quite funny to watch. They don't even know that they're doing it, but they are doing it. So it used to be that we had <clears throat> two competing ideologies, basically. Mm. So, but they were both aiming at the same thing. So you had uh, a kind of an open market ideology, and you had kind of m more of a, um, a state controlled emphasis that's ideology. That's not my view. I think that uh, I think that works in practice if you examine yeah. it. For the, 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 the idea of the, the market versus the state seems to me to be quite a recent, almost post-Thatcherite contradiction. Mm -hmm. An awful lot of political conservatives would have been perfectly happy for the large levels of state intervention. It would depend on what it was. And it, for instance, it's hard to see how you could have a Royal Navy without state intervention. Uh, and the post office originates not from socialism, but from I think um, King Henry VIII's desire to read other people's letters. So it's the, the, the state has always intervened, and the, the, this contradiction between state and market seems to me to be new. Now, what you had, I think, in this country was was too. Uh, my theory is that it's partly an effect of the Norman Conquest, which has always led to a divided country, and partly a, a continuing reflection of the English Civil War. But there are two sides uh, who share a country mm. and who share a, an ultimate uh, belief in, in that country and in, in being members of the same family, but who have different interests. And in the years of particularly of, sort of old fashioned industrial capitalism and trade unions, that was most easily reflected as a, as a labor versus employers thing. Mm. That's out of date now. Uh, and it's so how's taken it, how's it something completely yeah. different. T tell us about how you think it's changed. Well, it partly <clears> changed <throat> because pretty, uh, one of Margaret Thatcher always used, or her supporters always used to boast that she got rid of industrial strife. Mm. Uh, well, it's always amused me as a former industrial correspondent who covered all those strikes. The reason why there aren't any strikes anymore is there aren't any industries for them to take place in. Uh, she got rid of them. So the, the whole nature of the country changed. The yeah. way people live and work changed completely. Um, but the political parties remained in name at least, and in, in badge terms, more or less where they'd been before this happened. At the same time, the Cold War came to an end mm. with a con convincing defeat. I won't say there was a victory for anybody else, but a convincing defeat for, uh, for the state-centralized communism. And so an awful lot of the really fundamental beliefs of dogmatic socialism were sent flying. Uh, but on the other hand, quite a lot of the old, I would say, Jacobin revolutionary beliefs of the 18th century, which had been incorporated into socialist movements, came alive again. So the aim, <clears throat> the, the, the aim here would be to say, if somebody's watching this now and thinks, do I just vote on um, or do I make my political choices based on the policies, whether it be student fees or whatever, or is there something I should really consider behind those policies. Well, here's the, here's the problem. A, a lot of, ever since the advertising industry and politics merged in the 1950s in the United States or slightly later here, mm. what's presented to you as the policy of the party at the election is probably not its policy at all, but a series of things which that party has decided it's going noisily to espouse in the hope of getting your vote, but isn't really very interested in. Mm. And the New Labour Project is the absolute epitome of this. Mm. And they, they, they came up with these slogans like tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime, 
which was untrue in both cases, or education, 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 which was a total fraud because I think education got substantially worse under their mm. governments. But these were things to beguile the ad mass voters mm. while they got on with their very, very serious projects anyway. Mm. And so what you get in an election, what you're, what you're told in an election has so little bearing on what you actually get from the government you then choose that you aren't really choosing. So does that mean we don't effectively have democracy? Oh, on the contrary, we have uh, we have it hot and strong. Uh, democracy being given if you give the decision to the to to an undifferentiated mass, which is what universal suffrage mm. is, uh, without any regard for experience, wisdom, knowledge, or anything like that, then you what you will get is is decisions taken about who governs the country taken by the uneducated mass, which is therefore immediately subject to huge amounts of manipulation by advertising and public relations men. That's what spin doctors are. That's what it's or for. Facebook and Google. Well, it's, it, they any method that comes to hand you can use. I, obviously, once mm. television became important, that was one which the, which the, the political publicists and advertisers used. Uh, and what a lot of what they were doing was straightforward public relations, mm. engineering consent for what they wanted to do anyway. So if you wanted to be a responsible person politically and you wanted to try and find out what the right thing was to do, whatever you might define as the right thing, and the, 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 the prima facie policies aren't indicative of what the right thing is, how do you find out? Well, you can't. Uh, I, I think civilised intelligent people increasingly understand that, that, <coughs> uh, that politics in its current state is mm. something which... Uh, loathes uh, knowledge and loathes intelligence and despises wisdom and has no place for them. And the only thing to do is go and cultivate your garden and hope the sky doesn't fall down on top of you. I do. <laughs> Build a house in the woods and. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I, I really don't think that any, that especially now, especially since the era of, of, of the New Labour in this country and the era of Clinton in the United States, I don't think any any well-informed person with the welfare of the world uh, prominent in his or her mind can morally take much part in modern politics. I think it's a dead thing. So it's funny because you mentioned something there which seems to me to have been a change over the past maybe two decades, maybe a bit more, in that it used to be that people were aiming for the same thing and had different ways of achieving it? Well, not so much aiming for the same thing. They were, they were aiming, they were disagreeing about how something which they both valued should be managed. Right. But it was a, it was a family disagreement. It's the old George Orwell uh, summary of what, <coughs> how he saw Britain in 1940 as a family yeah. with the wrong members in control. Ultimately, there was, a, there was a fundamental common interest. But then it almost seems to me now that we've, we've almost there's almost two separate games being played. So there's that game there where, where people are arguing about how you achieve the aims, whatever the aims are. But then there's almost a completely separate power game being played over here, which is a different new type of game. There are all kinds of things loose which most people don't understand or care about until it affects them personally. Yeah. I mean, who really understood what was going on when the great new free trade arrangements came into force, which have flooded the markets of the Western countries with cheap goods. And the initial effect of that, of course, for most people was to keep the cost of living down, mm. particularly in the clothes and, being the, mm. and electronic goods and being in the spectacular areas where people felt their lives were improving. And then they saw the other side of this, which was that there were fewer and fewer jobs for them to do because these things were being made mm. by people who paid far less than them far away. And then the the, the, the next part of that kicks in, which is that they find that the level of wages and the standard of living in their own country begins to fall because the, the downward pressure on wages mm. and the upward pressure on the amount of work you have to do is felt. The fact that someone is is supplying these industries by working in a sweatshop in, in, in Canton, thousands of miles away, doing, what, 15-hour, seven-day weeks, mm. Uh, means ultimately a pressure on you, and these things don't present themselves initially as, as, as what they are. They, they, they always turn up appearing to be good. And we're going through that procedure. We're also living in a world where all the old ideas of national sovereignty, of countries being fundamentally separate from each other, are under very considerable attack. And so, uh, particularly the idea of national borders and of, uh, and of national law uh, is fading away before our very eyes, and it makes a huge impact. 
So you would be a fan of Douglas Murray's book, Strange Death of Europe? Well, I must confess, I haven't read Douglas's book yet. I keep meaning to, but I haven't. You can imagine what it says. <laughs> I, 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 can't, I don't want to comment on something yeah. I, haven't, I, I haven't read, honestly. Yeah, yeah, okay. So how do you think that impacts on the UK, however we leave Europe, whenever we leave Europe? Oh, well, I took no part in that. I, could, I had always <clears> thought that the only way... For, I, I thought that it was important for this country to leave the European Union if it was co to continue to mm. exist as a country. My concerns weren't to do with being you know, being able to enjoy the tangy flavour of, of chlorine washed chicken mm. uh, on a Sunday, nor did I particularly believe that we should uh, we should import more goods from the Far East. I my main concern was and is actually the the separate legal system which this country has, which seems to me to be incredibly, yeah. extraordinarily valuable. Mm. <coughs> and it, it just wasn't possible, it seemed to me, to have only fundamentally United Kingdom and, oddly enough, the Republic of Ireland mm. sharing common law and, uh, and all the things that go with it, and also the tradition of Magna Carta and habeas corpus, mm. while the rest of the continent uh, went for civil code. Mm. And I couldn't see, ultimately, there would be any other outcome of that, and that we would have to adopt civil code and give that up. And I thought that was too much of a thing to say goodbye to. And, I would be willing to pay quite a price to keep it, but obviously that's me. I can't ask other people to pay that to pay that price unless they've decided it's important. I had wanted for, for there to be a political party in this country which was committed to leaving the European Union, mm. knew why, and would implement it, and for such a party to put that policy before the electorate and for them to vote for it and for it then to happen. The idea of it being sh be, being short-circuited by a referendum was mm. repellent to me for a mm. huge number of reasons. I hate referenda. I think mm. they're licensed to manipulate, and, and they make the, the the lying which takes takes place in general mm. elections look quite minor. They're almost impossible to get yeah. fairly. So I'm I'm completely and utterly unsympathetic with with. with with the current mess, which doesn't even seem to me to be mainly about the things that concern me. So I want to take you back a couple of steps. So I stand back from it. Yeah, well, that's okay. But then perhaps getting there, I'll take you back a couple of steps. We were discussing the difference between ideologies, political ideologies. And um, although they've kind of, with, with New Labour, there was a lot of a rush towards the centre and a, no, a no, blurring. No, that is a complete and utter misunderstanding of what New Labour was about. Right. New, uh, new Labour's slogans and New Labour's presentation was designed to suggest uh, that there was a convergence between New Labour and Conservative Party. Yep. Uh, well, uh, I'll leave aside that claim for a moment. But what it was fundamentally about was making something look like something that it wasn't. N new Labour comes out of Eurocommunism. It comes out of a uh, out, of the, out of Gramsci's realization, Antonio Gramsci's realization in the 1920s. Mm that the Bolsheviks were, had failed. He knew back in the 1920s that they had failed, that, this, that, that, that the Lenin's revolution would never be copied in prosperous mm -hmm. countries with, with uh, long-standing Christian cultures, that the only way to transform such countries would be mm -hmm. to obtain cultural hegemony by the left, and to, 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 instead of seizing the post office and the mm -hmm. barracks, and the railway station, you seize the television studio and the university and the school mm. and the newspaper, and you become dominant in the culture. And also, the things that you're interested in aren't necessarily nationalizing the widget industry. Uh, what you're much more interested in is reducing the power of the family uh, and of, of, of <coughs> fracturing the old bonds of marriage and replacing mm. them with new social arrangements, which are which are actually r reduce the power, particularly of mm. Christianity, mm. and open people's minds to the possibility <coughs> of another dispensation. That's what it's about. Uh, there aren't many people, there aren't many people even in New Labour who understand that's what they were doing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but that is what they were doing. It is what they did. And the the huge changes made by New Labour in its early mm. years, to, first of all, to the constitution. Uh, in sexual politics yeah. uh, and in the rearrangement of, of, of the family. And also, of course, this, this goes with the breakdown of the nation state, the opening yeah. up of borders, the, the subjection of Britain to supranational bodies, mm. uh, was what they were about. And all the rest, as I say, was, was top dressing. And it, this was a fantastically radical project. It was the most 
radical political projects in this in this but, country since Oliver Cromwell. But Mr. Cameron, then and people still talk about it as if it was a uh, some sort of form of Toryism. It's nonsensical. But Mr. Cameron carried it on, didn't he? Really? He deliberately adopted it. Yeah, but without understanding what it was. Right. He just thought that it was necessary. The Conservative Party has <coughs> has has. It used to boast that it had no dogma. Mm. It was a disposition. And when its opponents also had no dogma, that was a reasonable thing to say. But really, I suppose since the middle 50s, the Labour Party has moved away from being a, an arm of the British trade union movement of working class mm -hmm. into being the, the party of bourgeois, bohemian, metropolitan intellectuals. <laughs> and and to, to, to combat that, you need to understand their ideology. Well, Cameron didn't understand their ideology. He just understood that they, what they did won elections, so he adopted their election winning machine, and in doing mm. so, he also pretty much adopted their policies, to which he saw no personal objection because he didn't understand them, he didn't know what they were about. Yeah. So, it's quite amusing for me as a former Trotskyist watching a, a, a nominally conservative government implementing policies, which, when I was a Trotskyist in the late 1960s and early yeah. 1970s, I would have found a bit radical. Yeah, what changed your mind about what? Well, not being a Trotskyist. Oh, well, this is a boring old thing. I say this all the time. Every, I just did what everybody in every century of every history of mankind had done until now. I grew up. Okay. Uh, the great difference is you shouldn't be asking me <clears throat> why I changed my mind. Mm. You should be asking all my co-evils, the rest of my generation, mm. why they still have the same opinions, more or less, that they have when, well, they, a lot of them when they were teenagers. So if you look at... if you look Why do people go to Rolling Stones concerts in their 60s? What's wrong with them? They have not grown up. They are perpetual adolescents. Or they like music. Well, but, but people's... You know, do, 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 I used to like corned beef. <laughs> and and, and Coca-Cola and things, but I grew out of it. <laughs> okay. and similarly, I, I, I listened, I, I remember listening rapidly <clears throat> to Big L, wonderful mm. Radio London, 266 mm. on, the, on, the, on the medium wave, uh, in the great days of popular music. Mm. And I can't stand that stuff now. So I, I'm, I grew out of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I get, but, but there I, are still... I likewise, I grew out of revolutionary politics. Yeah, but, but there are still... So touching on the Revolutionary Party, there are still the kind of postmodernists, if you like, who are just kind of like the old school with a new nomenclature, a new kind of taxonomy for the same old stuff in many ways. But, so who are you talking about? Well, if I put the argument as opposed to the people, right? So you've got the old argument um, of, on the one side, you've got a free market where basically let people get rich, let people get wealthy. Well, that's just that's liberalism. That has, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, got, that's, that's but you've got, just a, but, a 19th but, century thing. If, if you're, and what I'm trying to do here is say, so you, you, you've referenced um, uh, a, a kind of Christian legacy. And if you've got people who are Christians who are thinking, is there a right or a wrong way to think about what to vote for and who to pick in, in this confusing state that we find ourselves in? So you, you've, got, you've got the two opposing general views although there's, there's a third massive emerging one now, but the, the two main ones, you've got the open market stuff and actually let people yeah, get rich. That's good for no, society. You're, 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 people don't vote because of their opinions or because of arguments. They vote tribally. People look, look at any general election. Yeah. Uh, people sometimes say to me, why don't you stand for parliament? And I yeah. say, well, first of all, because no political party would, yeah. uh, which is capable of winning a seat would choose me because you've misunderstood the nature of parliamentary elections. People at parliamentary elections don't vote for the candidate. Yeah. The candidate is selected by the party machine and placed yeah, before yeah. them and yeah. they elect him. People say, well, what about Martin Bell? And I say, well, what about Martin oh, Bell? That's Martin just... Bell was elected because <clears throat> the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats yeah. withdrew. He, could, he wouldn't have had a prayer of winning that. So I, uh, we've that. driven up but today. It, there is no way into, into, into British politics unless you can get the approval of one of the big tribes. And, th and that, is not, that is not done on the basis of, of, uh, of, of reason. And nor when the election takes place is any reason involved. You can argue about anything at an election. And nobody will be paying any attention. In general election, if you're standing for Labour, yeah. and it's a Labour seat, you'll win the, you'll, you'll, you'll win the seat you'll become a member yeah. of Parliament. And if you aren't, you won't. So we've driven down this morning from Wales, which arguably is the nearest thing we've got to a single party state. They've had one party holding on to the reins of power for about 20 years. And you've got an awful lot of the tribalism mm -hmm. where people will vote one way um, because that's what their father's done. That's what they've. And ever since Thatcher closed the mines is the phrase which is used. Yeah, well, she did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a, and, and, that's, and that's, you know, it's, it's an awful situation and people haven't forgotten that. Um, so what do you do about infecting democracy in a democratic process 
more realistically into a situation. Well, like I, that. I mean, it, it, you could ask me all kinds of theoretical things about what you might do, uh, and, and people will will then reel back in horror when I say, "I'm not really a Democrat." You see, I, I for, for some time I've thought that universal suffrage democracy hmm. uh, looked to me, the old the old supposed Churchill remark that it was the it was the least bad least worst option that doesn't necessarily seem to me to follow mm. uh, watching what as well I used to <laughs> new labor people used to say what do you say all these things about us but why is it we keep getting we keep getting re-elected if, mm. if we're so nice well, to which my response is well it is a puzzle isn't it <laughs> but you can't um, you can't really look at this and say that universal suffrage democracy has been a wild success. And I believe that the, the, the real keys to civilization are liberty of speech, thought, and assembly. Yep. yep. And, and the rule of law. And the rule of law. Absolutely and right. Without yeah. those things, you're lost. And you look at somewhere like Turkey, where universal suffrage democracy <clears> has been <throat> used very effectively in the past 10 years by Mr. Erdogan to destroy mm. freedom. Now, there is no rule of law in Turkey. Now you can be picked up by the governor, thrown in prison, and that's the end of you. And there is no liberty. And the, mm. what was, a, for instance, a, a really powerful and apparently impregnable free press has now been completely mm. destroyed in a mm. short matter of years, and all with democratic authority. Mm. So I don't see that there's... The, but I, when I used to say this, uh, and I, I, to, in front of audiences of, of metropolitan liberals, you could hear a sort of sussuration going around, a fascist. <laughs> since the election of Donald Trump yeah. and since the the victory of the Leave vote in the referendum, I don't get that. Anymore. It's all relative, yeah, well, isn't they it? Don't, they, don't, they don't think it's quite such a fascist idea yeah. as they used to. When you have it your own way, universal suffrage democracy looks good. When you don't have it your own way, you think about it. Well, I haven't had it my own way during most of my adult life, so I, I think about it. It doesn't appeal. I, I, could, I, I could come up with the great Neville Shute formula for, for, um, for replacing universal suffrage democracy mm. with, with extra votes for people who had shown themselves to be uh, experienced, who had successfully raised a family, Ooh, who had China, skills. China system. Well, so you get, you get, well, isn't China this, China's kind of, they China, want to give you points China doesn't for, have elections, so, no, 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 so but they want to give you kind of cultural points no, for not, good a, behavior. This is extra, this is, this is the more experienced, the more wise you are, the more knowledgeable you <laughs> yeah. are, the more votes you get, not the, not the richer you are. Yeah. It's just a, something similar should, in my view, be, de mm. be devised for juries, uh, for jury selection, that would be the idea that, that, that some 18 year old who's, who's mm. never worked and has no experience in life could mm. decide the entire fate of somebody's life seems mm. to me to be very worrying. But I favour juries, so how do you how do you get around it? Uh, you have some sort of selection that's based not on, say, on wealth, but on yeah. experience and wisdom would be the thing. But of course, who's ever going to who's ever going to vote for that? So you don't agree with sixteen-year-olds getting the vote, for example? I think I probably was qualified to vote around about the age of thirty. I certainly wasn't qualified to mm. vote. I was one of the first. I I was given the vote at eighteen. Uh, as a matter of mm. fact, and, uh, and you've not used it. Uh, yeah, I used it that year. Okay, and it was partly my <coughs> fault, but um, I, I suppose. Um, it, it, well, hang on, what happened? Nineteen seventy was the year I used it. Yeah, so it can't have been my fault that mm. um, that, 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 that that Ted Heath won the election because I would have I, I would have voted Labour in the quite mm. closely contested Oxford constituency. That mm. um, and so you can't blame that. You can't blame yeah. that on me, but. Uh, no, I have, I have voted, but I, g I gave up voting long ago. Mm. Uh, it's, first of all, I began almost invariably being away on mm. assignment during elections, so I didn't. Secondly, I live in a Labour seat, mm. uh, so safe it wouldn't make any difference. Mm. And then ultimately I began <clears throat> to feel I couldn't be bothered. Okay. So I just haven't voted for years and years and years and years, and I can't recommend for other people to do it. But there are there would there are ways of of, of of withdrawing from what seems to me to be the error of universal suffrage democracy, which is quite new. Mm. The United States didn't have it till the middle of the First World War. Until then, the Senate was not elected. People don't know this. Mm. Uh, the Senate was an appointed body, and the and was designed specifically to be immune from what the <coughs> founding fathers called the the fury of democracy. Mm. And until 1948, uh, we didn't have universal suffrage democracy in this country. There were still university seats. For and we still effectively we've got votes. the House of Lords, which doesn't well, House, quite the House of Lords is not, is, is, is now, um, it has absolutely nothing whatever to do with democracy at all, except in the case of the small number of mm. 
hereditary peers who get elected by ballot. It's, it is just an appointed house, mm. like the Canadian Senate and I think the Irish Senate. And mm. it, as a result, it's much, much worse than it was when it was hereditary. So it still feels to me, and perhaps this is a Welsh thing, I don't know, but it still feels to me that there is a lot of the, the, the rich, poor, fortunate, unfortunate, um, victim perpetrator, although the victim perpetrator seems to be starting its own thing over here. But, and I've discussed this with, with a couple of people. And from my point of view, I would be much more um, open market than state control in my philosophy and preference, because I think that leads to a lot more growth. But something somebody put to me was quite interesting, which I thought I'd share with you and see what you think. If you've got an entrepreneur, you've got somebody who creates a business and that business takes off and it does very, very well, and they eventually end up employing thousands and thousands of people, let's say. Um, you've got one argument that says, well, why shouldn't that person continue to take the wealth from the business? And you've got another argument that says, well, why don't we pay that person off for their initial input and then share the wealth among the people in the business? Uh, which, which kind of would be an ideological thing that a lot of people, I think, would still split on in terms of ownership, rich, workers. I'd split on practicality. Poor. I don't think that would work. Why would people go why would people go into business? Most businesses don't become huge, great giants. No. They, the backbone most of the country is small. Small and medium. And the businesses, and right. the, the the risks are not equally shared and <clears> the rewards are not equally shared. But it, the, the, also it's 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 public relations spin yeah. to say that people go into business so they can employ people. Yeah. They go into business to succeed and what in the course of doing so is it's a it's a, a consequence of their success is that people are employed, but they don't do it so that they can. There isn't necessarily a permanent common interest between any employer and any employee. That's one of the reasons why I've always been a trade union member all my life. Yeah. You, it simply isn't the case that they, they necessarily share total common interest. So, I, but I, in terms of practicality, I don't think you get people to, to go in, particularly to small and medium-sized businesses, if they then face confiscation of the whole lot as soon as they reach a certain mm. level of success, which wouldn't happen. Uh, so I, I, that, that's not practical. I, it, it, the poor you have always with you. There will mm -hmm. always be some people who are less materially fortunate than others. The trick is to ameliorate this as much as possible and to make sure that it doesn't uh, doesn't do uh, any more damage than you can conceivably avoid. And that's where what seemed to me, in my ignorance, the old order seemed to be quite effective. It was. Yeah. So it you was. Had, you I, had I think I this think, group over here I looking think, after. I think Britain before. I, Bill Bryson's quite good on this in in, in his um, his love affair. A letter to England. The, the England that, that that existed just before the Thatcher era began was quite fair, mm. uh, and also not and, and also reasonably prosperous. Uh, what happened since then is this: is it has got to the point where there are quite small numbers of people. And this isn't just so in Britain; it's so in almost all the advanced countries. Mm. Quite small numbers of people have enormous concentration as well. Mm. Uh, whereas the standard of life of, of, the, of the mass of people, I think, is probably falling now. So what do I don't think that's, it, it, I'm not sure that's necessarily, a, I'm not sure whether, how much alternative there would ever have been to it. Mm. I'm not sure how inevitable the globalization of the world was. Uh, I'd like to think it might have been avoidable and that some people might have had the sense mm. to avoid it. They might eventually at some point be, if not reversible, then at least possible to mm. slow it down and moderate it. But I think it hasn't been a success for an awful lot of people. And one of the one of the reasons for the results of the European Union referendum, which wasn't, of course, uh, wholly about the European Union, mm. was a, a lot of people outside the prosperous southeast saying to the people in the prosperous southeast, actually, what is this recovery you keep mm. telling us about? There hasn't been one. Their lives are pretty grim. Yeah, grim. But globally, um, many people globally are, are, have been taken out of poverty since well, about 2001. Okay. It's, and it's, it's, are... Sure, it's not poverty, but it's, it's, it's deprivation. Yeah. And it's no good saying to somebody living in some blasted area of Greater Manchester, yeah. with <clears throat> long, long rows of closed shops yeah. like yeah. Detroit, uh, you're better off than somebody in an African township. Well, indeed yeah. they are, but yeah. that, that's, not what they, that's not what they've come to expect. Uh, yeah. And it's no comfort to them. 
but it's relative to the people around you. Well, which is, everything is relative. Isn't it? relative. Yeah. But the problem with, with policy in this country is, that, is that, or, or, which isn't policy, I wouldn't, just, but the problem with, yeah. with falling standards of living in this country is that they are relative to what people used to know. And yeah. here is the thing, which I will ceaselessly point out. By the middle 60s and, and, and 70s, it was possible for, for working class people mm. To raise a family in a decent house and send their children to tolerable schools on a single income. Hmm. Well, that's completely gone. Nobody manages on a single income. Would you, would that you seems say, to me to be a sharp drop in the standard of living of almost everybody. Would you say it's almost the breakdown of the family, which is now making it very hard to have a stable family? There's no almost about it. The family is on a siege. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, do you think that's? Do, do you think that's? Before we look at what on earth we do about that, which I would like to to cover, do you think that's happening purposefully or almost by mistake? Um, I think some people. Um, in my book, The Evolution of Britain, I go yeah. into the Margaret Sanger and various other people who were involved in the early development of the of the contraceptive pill, and they definitely did have an agenda. They 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 wanted to overturn. What would nowadays be called the patriarchy, and they, mm. they 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 have that in mind. The concept of pill wasn't just developed in isolation from social or sexual politics, and it, mm. it, it, it results from the desire of some people to change the world, which is in, in, it, it has been at least as revolutionary as the Bolsheviks in, yeah. in changing things. Um, so there is there is ideolo ideology in it. But a lot of what happens in the modern world, it doesn't result from people desiring anything, it results from the collapse of what was. So several hundred years of Christian civilization lost the will to live, I think largely after the First World War. And that left a vacuum into which all kinds of things could rush. And the, the fundamental defender of, the, of solid family life was the church. Mm. And the church and its teachings are now so weak and forgotten uh, that even to put the arguments in favour, for instance, of lifelong marriage, mm. is to take a risk. People won't understand what you're on about. Mm. You really think that that, uh, <clears throat> that divorce is a bad thing? Well, yeah, I do. Mm. Uh, but that you, you're not you're not just you're not just a fringe figure. You're mm. an eccentric, verging on being a dissident. <laughs> and and the role of men and women in marriage. The, oh, I, I don't. The different roles of men and women. For me, I think I think that that, that <clears throat> role is, is 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 variable and 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 could easily be be have been improved as it yeah. has been, without any challenge to the family as such. There's not a word in Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's mm. Own with which I disagree. Mm. I think it's a completely valid manifesto for a, for a change in the way in which women are equal treated. opportunity. Uh, not just equal, but a, a, a general ending of the idea of of, 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 of the woman as being yeah. a second class. So, yes, and, that's, yeah. and it's it's eloquently stated, and it's absolutely right. And the ludicrous behaviour, for instance, of the great universities in resisting women as 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 first of all. As, um, as undergraduates and, yeah. uh, and giving them degrees, and many, many other examples of this are absurd. Yeah. But that's a separate issue from whether you think that you can really, really act as if there's no difference between men and women, because there is a fundamental difference. It's just the, the women are the ones who bear the children. Yeah. And that, that uh, I think, for the moment, is, is, is a fixed matter, and it has a huge impact. Yeah. But no, I think huge amounts of things have changed for the better in the way in which women are treated. But that, that's independent of of the uh, the strength or weakness of lifelong marriage. So one area where, and perhaps I've misunderstood, um, but one area where we seem to differ is in what to do about things. So oh, I, have, I, have no, I have no, I have no temporal political ambitions at all. I, I feel that uh, it's it's gone. People used to say to me, oh, come on, stop standing on the sidelines, whatever yeah. sidelines are. Yeah. Do you know what sidelines are? I don't know. I don't know why. Anyway, that's what I was accused of standing on and, and get involved. So I got involved and I said what, I thought very hard about what to do. I said what we really need to do above all things in this country to obtain political change for the better is to destroy the Conservative Party. And there's a very simple thing you need to do mm. to, um, to achieve this. And I said, it's not don't vote Conservative in the 2010 general election. And people, all the people even say to me, tell us, tell us, tell us what to do. 
Uh, and I said, this is what you do. And they said, oh, no, we can't do that. It reminded me of a joke that uh, Jack Jones, the trade union leader, once mm. told me of a man who falls from the... Uh, falls from, from, the, from the side of a dock in Liverpool and halfway down he grabs onto a ledge and he's hanging there and the place is empty, darkness is coming on and he's hanging there by his fingertips swinging in the wind which is howling and he calls up is there anybody there? and eventually a sort of sepulchral voice from very high up in the sky he says, I am there my son and the man hanging by his fingers from the dock side says what shall I do? And the sepulchral voice from one high says, let go. <laughs> and he calls out, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> they, 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 I was giving advice that nobody wanted to take. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was, it, 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 there was a sort of dissonance in it. People, people couldn't see that not voting Conservative might lead to Conservative results. It's like that thing when your car overheats, the thing to do is, is turn up the heat. Put the heater on so it sucks yeah, all the absolutely yeah. It's down. not obvious, but it works. Yeah. Uh, and this was not obvious, but it would have worked. I couldn't get anyone to pay any attention. And ever since then, I've just watched the, 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 the country scrabbling down mm. the, the slopes of the furnace, and I can't do anything about it. And it was only making me unhappy. So I just decided I just, I, I, I've given up. I have no but you interest are, in So who, who is it that said um, uh, all, all that? And I use the word evil as a general term here. All evil needs to succeed is that good people do nothing. Well, Evan Burke is always said to have said it. But it wasn't him, though, was it? Yeah, so yeah. it's just one of those things. Yeah, yeah. I, evil is quite capable of succeeding when good mm. men do lots. Mm. I think but, good men can scrabble away frantically and nothing nothing will happen. If, my if point the, is, if, so, if so the you're general, saying... If the general mood is towards disaster, then disaster will happen. Yeah, yeah. And, and you, you mentioned, well, perhaps it needs God. Perhaps it needs the church to revitalise itself a little but bit. As soon as you say these things, you know they're not going to happen. But what, I mean, and perhaps... Sometimes it, civilizations, not sometimes, often, pretty much invariably, civilizations come to an end. This is what we're living through. This is what we're witnessing. What does I'm, that, hoping I'll, is, I'm hoping it won't get too bad before I die. What does that mean, though, civilizations coming to an end? Well, it means the breakdown of, of, of civilization. It means people no longer are being governed by law or self-restraint. It means the end. Uh, there was a quite good but unsuccessful film made uh, with, I think, Gwyneth Paltrow a few years ago called Contagion, about one of these sort of swine flu type, bird flu yeah. type diseases yeah. which takes hold. And I think I saw it on an airplane where you often see films that haven't had much <laughs> success as well. I think one of the reasons why it didn't uh, catch on was because it's a depiction of what happens to an advanced and prosperous society yeah. when order breaks down it was quite convincing. Yeah. Uh, once people start started roaming the prosperous suburbs with guns, yeah. uh, robbing each other, and when the supplies stopped arriving, yeah. the electricity shut down. It it, it was too close to a, an easily mm. imaginable truth about there's, there's, what, what a, may happen. Yeah. And I, it, civilization is a thin crust. There's That's another book. Uh, was it one second after, with a forward by Newt Gingrich, which talks about um, uh, uh, what they call uh, EMP. Oh, yes. Yeah, yes taking yes, place yes. across America and everything suddenly stops working. Yeah, everything stops. And, and the chaos that ensues because anyway. of that. And, yeah. and that's quite, it's very, and Newt Gingrich's point of view in the, in the foreword was this could really happen. It's, yeah, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a prospect. In fact, I once visited, in, when I was in Moscow, a huge park of veteran steam engines, which the Soviet regime had kept in being because they reckoned that if electromagnetic pulses ever mm. unleashed on the USSR, the only way to get anything moving would be steam, mm. engine, steam mm. engine. So they kept them. <laughs> but but do you not had. still feel? Just, just like... Well, that's a diversion from the point, which is civilization is vulnerable, and yeah. it's, I, I, it amazes me that it keeps going out of habit. I, for instance, if, 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 as soon as the criminal class is realized just how pathetic our criminal yeah. justice system is, which they haven't quite cottoned onto yet, the, the danger to the rest of us is huge. And what happened in the supposed <coughs> riots, when was it? Uh, was it 2013? Uh, that summer when, yeah. when, it, when it all, when, when, when mm. the police basically lost control mm. of London. Yeah, that was 20, about 2011. Wasn't and it? Yeah. it was, there was a particular, there was a very yeah. fancy restaurant somewhere down in uh, a little south of Notting Hill as a very extraordinary incident place where the the bad guys came rushing in. The restaurant was serving the customers in there. They were having their, 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 their three Michelin star hmm. meals. 
and the bad guys came to the restaurant and started with threats of knives and force, demanding the wallets and handbags of all the of all the rich mm. diners, who were so completely unused to the idea that anybody might take what they had that they mm. sat there and they took it. The staff of the restaurant, realizing that if this went ahead, their occupation had gone, they couldn't. They were the ones who came out of the kitchen with the meat cleavers and chased the bad guys away. <laughs> because from then, it was vital to defend uh, civilization because their lives depended on these, but, but they, the English well-off middle classes have lost the will to defend themselves. They wouldn't, and if attacked, they don't want to do. It was a very interesting little vignette of what, uh, of what might come. The other thing about that was it wasn't people called it right, it, wasn't, it was like political about it. It was simply a realization by bad people that there was no longer a sort of struggle. Well, my, my grandfather, who was in that uh, camp in, in, in Germany, um, told me many years, many times before he died, how amazed he was at what civilized men would do when there was no rule of law. And how completely amazed he was at that. And that's, that's astonishing. But is, isn't that. This is what people don't. But it's, the, get, it's, the, it's the aspects of the, of the camps that people don't. No. understands um, the way in which yeah. the inmates, yeah. many of whom had been the doctors, lawyers, civilized yeah. people, turned on each other yeah. for a crust. Yeah. Uh, because that was because it was it was that or die. Yeah, you're right. And but my point is, is there nothing we can do to stop us from getting to we're heading down a bad road in terms I don't know of what it is. for police in terms of I don't, isn't it if simple? there is such a thing I don't know what so it is I, I, think I started I went, I, I'm a newspaper yeah. hack yeah. I'm a scribble uh, and I began oddly enough while I was living in Moscow I began to develop a sort of relationship with you because what I reported all the stuff the Politburo does this Yeltsin does that and so on and so forth and that, that you know, was necessary but the point at which I engaged with the readers is when I began to describe how people actually lived. Mm. Uh, people particularly liked the thing I read about a beer bar in Moscow it was an immensely yeah. sordid experience, not, not, not to be recommended. But it, it could be, uh, people would start writing to her. And out of that came writing a weekly column when I got, eventually came back here on what life was like here. And I f began to feel, I have a voice, I have a platform, I might be able to influence matters. And that drove me to write my first book, The Abolition of Britain, which is now almost 20 years old, still in print. And in it, I set out a number of, I explained, a lot of people attached to me, don't, never read it, don't know what kind of book it is, yeah. never know what it says. I explained how things had gone wrong. And I followed it with another one a few years later about called The Brief History of Crime, which I explained what it gone wrong with criminal justice was I had a lot of work. I spent a lot of time at the library, a lot of time in my best finding out what had happened and how it had happened. Mm. And by implication, what I was doing was saying, this is how you might do the crime. And all I got in return was derision. And I kept on going, I got, and, I, and, I, and I carried on going up until, as I say, the, 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 what, about four or five years before the 2010 election. Mm. Uh, when I decided, well, actually, yes, there is something we can do, and what really needs to be done. This now sounds as though because we see people peeling away from the Labour and Tory yeah. parliamentary parties at the moment. What we need is, is a complete revolution in our political parties, which no longer represent the real position of the country, and particularly what needs to go is a Conservative party, which is not Conservative mm -hmm. and doesn't, doesn't represent Conservative thought or desires. And this is how you do it. It's easy. You don't even need to do anything. You just stay at home mm -hmm. on election day and, and you will achieve it. And people wouldn't do it. I really said to that. And I found the, the referendum, I, there was a, I had a, a, a joyous moment of schadenfreude of watching all my opponents discomforted. I cannot deny that, that I did enjoy it from that. But I, I, did, I, I did a very responsible thing though. The morning of the, of the results, when Radio 4's six o'clock bulletin uh, said in its headlines, Sterling has collapsed, actually rang up the production office of the Today Program. I said, You can't say that. The 
it's not, first of all, it's not true. Not true. By saying, you, you may make it. Shut up. Oh, and I, and I, I do think that, that, you know, that because I, you know, that I was more responsible than they were. But the, it, it, I had realized some weeks before which way it was going to go. So I felt vindicated in that. But I had taken no part in it. I didn't like it. I never liked Nigel Farage's party mm -hmm. or anything to do with it. <clears throat> uh, and uh, I, I won't even use the B word because it mm -hmm. seems to me to be a crudity. And I just felt washed aside by a great uh, avalanche of, of, uh, of, of sensations, some of which have something to do with what I think, but many of which seem to me to be totally false, crude, and misdirected. Uh, but at the moment, you know, if one goes onto any kind of uh, any kind of opinion pal shows, which side are you on? Uh, Reese Morgan Farage or, or, or Anna Subri? And I'm on neither side. That touches on some of the same kind of background stuff, which is in something like Gulag Archipelago, right? which, which, and there's, there's, there's an abridged version just being brought out, which everyone should read the abridged version, it's readable, and it just gives you an idea of how a nation for, descends slowly and gently into oblivion. And there are lots of examples here, and some tied into that, a piece of research I was, slowly and gently. Yeah, a piece of research I was looking at um, not so long ago about MPs and the majority of MPs feeling unable to express their real opinion on certain matters. Well, that may be true. I, I, I just feel that many of them don't have much of their developed opinion. I'm looking at particularly at, um, at the behaviour of MPs, which I've observed in two issues. Yeah. Uh, say the campaign, very, very wealthy and powerful campaign to decriminalise marijuana. Uh, it's almost impossible to find a member of parliament who hasn't been taken in and locked on the barrel by the uh, by the PR man. Are they taken in, or do they fear the backlash? Yeah, of they, 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 they want to see. What, I actually went and, and gave evidence to a, to a hearing of the Home Affairs Committee. It was astonishing. I, I, I wasn't prepared for the questions that they asked me because they were so stupid. I, I couldn't believe anybody could be so ignorant on the on the subject. Um, so, so I, I was I was discombobulated by questions which I hadn't expected, not because I wasn't prepared, but because I simply hadn't understood how how how, how utterly uninformed they were and how conformist they were. And recently, over the the attempt to get this country engaged directly in the Syrian civil war, which we created, uh, the the attitude of MPs, in, I think, without exception, there hasn't been a voice raised in the House of Commons against the idea that. It, that a British intervention in Syria would have been humanitarian in purpose, which was not true. And I just find, looking at the, at the, at the Parliament, I see no hope. The one or two individuals who one runs into and, and finds engaging and can see have a certain amount of hope. But in general, I think they're just not very good. Not very good, as in. They don't know much. Don't know much. They haven't. Not very good. What's much much. worse than that? None of us knows very much. They aren't aware that they don't know much. They make no effort to put it right. Uh, and they, it's it's not that they're afraid particularly, but it is always, of course, in Parliament, the, the people who decide your fate are the whips. It is, of course, always helpful to be conformist, but most people find it quite agreeable to be conformist. So, isn't it then left to the people? No. And I don't mean that in an uprising kind of way. I mean that in a very gentle, speak your mind and do it regularly. But people, have been, right. people have been deprived of important tools as well. The, the education system in this country is is a, is, is a international disgrace. Yeah. And people are taught what to think and not how to think. We no longer have anything remotely resembling an educated image in this country. Yeah. We simply haven't got it. I mean, there are people who are quite good at science, but increasingly have to import them mm. uh, because our schools aren't doing it very well. Mm. I mean, the, the private schools are not much better than the, than the state schools. In this. Our level of education is fantastically, pitifully low compared with what it was before the great educational revolution in the mid 60s. Mm. People just don't know anything. They don't know history, they don't know geography, they don't know uh, they, 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 the accumulated experience of the world has not been passed on to them. Okay, what was it? Their children. What two things would you change about the education system? Two things I would change. I, it's far more than two things. Yeah, but the, the, the fundamental change that needs to be undone is the, was the the abolition of academic selection in state secondary schools in, in, the, in the 1960s because you can't no there is not there is no such thing as a good school that doesn't select uh, and it still happens well we have we have, we have selection we have selection by all kinds of means yeah. but we don't have selection by ability and that that that, that is essential for, for 
a good school, and it was it was a common currency of conversation. I remember it in the in the nineteen sixties that, that a set of English A levels was worth the same as an American college degree. Who <laughs> would say that? Now there was a thing called the brain drain. The Americans raided our schools and our universities, particularly for scientists, mm -hmm. uh, because they were not their schools, their comprehensive schools, were not producing what we were. It's all gone now. Now, a lot of our universities have to have pre entry exams. Well, they, they can't but trust. It's, it, but it, it, it's, it's worse than that. And I think what happened, the, the really interesting history you can trace is the history of the GCE O level examination, which I remember taking. It's quite a rigorous, quite a rigorous examination. Uh, and first of all, after the abolition of the grad schools, it began to be devalued and regraded. Mm. And then it has to be abolished because the conferences simply couldn't cope with it. They couldn't prepare their peoples for it, so they were failing and were getting terrible grades. So the GCSE was introduced, and it was inflation. It was a billion mark note. Well, and, they, and, and all our educational studios since then have been billion mark notes. Yeah, and, and that is academic inflation is a problem, especially when worse than a problem. Privatized exam. How do you expect an electorate, which is as badly educated as ours, to take sensible decisions on any issue? Yeah. Also, with the, the structure of the literacy has been pretty bad. Well. So, the, but, but the counter argument would be uh, basically, you shouldn't be asking how clever are you, but how are you clever? Well, that's, Arguably, the new system will try and find out how you're clever well, instead of, uh, in this narrow uh, field, how clever you are. Exactly. The, the original tripartite 1944 system was um, recognised that people, the people were brilliant in different ways, yeah. that, that, that academic success wasn't any measure of success. And mandated the creation of technical schools, which in most parts of the country never existed. Manchester, I think, alone of the major educational authorities built quite a few. Oxford, well, I don't have one, but in general, it didn't exist. Yeah. Uh, it's a great mistake, and something we suffer from now. I mean, you look at Germany, it's, there's a lot of problems with modern Germany, um, but they, they maintain selective, academically selective state education. And indeed, they reintroduced it uh, to the old East Germany when the communism collapsed. And I think Germany has a higher level of political discourse and a higher level of, of skill and generally a higher level of everything that we do. It's a more successful country. I think that has a lot to do with it. And the other argument is it's kind of social transformation. You know, if, if you if you select at a young age, that's it for your life. It's almost like the, the, the Gattaca type thing where you kind of pin prick of blood when you're born and that well, decides no, the rest First of all, it, it all the academics Selection systems that I know of have, have safety um, doors through which people can pass who would wrongly classify too, too early. The reason for doing it early is precisely because if you don't catch children from poor homes early, mm. then you will lose them. And an awful lot of bright working class children in this country uh, who come out of reasonably good primary schools at a fairly good state of education then, as it, as it were, lose the will to live in terrible conferences which they're sent on to at 11. And that's when the, the, the decline really hits them. So you have to select early if you're going to catch them, but that doesn't mean you can't, you can't do another trawl of it later on to make sure you haven't missed anybody. Mm -hmm. Whereas selection by wealth on National Offer Day every March in, in, in England is, is absolutely final. And unless your parents win the lottery, uh, you're going to carry on staying where you were on that day because it's based on wealth, it's based on where you live, it's based on the lottery. What about faith based schools? Well, I think that I'm all in favour of, of, uh, of parents having their domestic faith backed up in schools. I think it's, it, it, they're entitled to it. I think the contribution of the churches to the, to the, to the building of the state education system is huge and has to be acknowledged. Uh, it would be a pity if they, were, if they were got rid of. And I'd be prepared to make almost any concession to keep them there. If people wanted to have atheist schools, that would be fine by me. <laughs> Uh, let us let a hundred flowers bloom. <laughs> if that was the price of continuing to have Christian schools, I'd cheerfully have atheist schools and Muslim schools and uh, anything else in the state system. But then people have to be permitted to choose some kind of methodology. Well, yeah, I don't. Well, I don't. I don't think it should be the case that uh, that the particularly in, in, in primary schools that it should be the people should pretend mm -hmm. to be um, to be religious to get their children into better schools. The, the question of why church schools tend to be better than and secular schools is an interesting one that needs to be explored. It hasn't, I don't think, ever really uh, been discovered. And these are problems that, that, that seem to me to be soluble by, by reason and compromise. But I, the fundamental one of making sure that the, 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 people, the people's talents 
are nurtured to the full is one which we're not doing at the moment. And that, uh, and, mm. and, and that I think we better make sure. So the, the private sector should cooperate with the state sector. Well, sure, it should. But how's it going to do it? There was a fantastic system for achieving that called direct grant schools. Yeah. Uh, which mm. which resulted in in huge numbers of people yeah. getting fantastic educations who could whose parents could never have afforded it, and which put into private schools large numbers of state pupils, and who shut it down. A Labour government, Fred Murray, the man who fell asleep in front of the Queen, he did it yeah. uh, as an act of deliberate policy. So they, you can't you can't do that and then come back later and say, oh well, the private schools aren't aren't, aren't, aren't helping out very much, having destroyed the mm. best. Coordination of the two that ever existed. And what about universities? So they're well, too trouble, many of them having trouble funding. We've got a, a student loan system which is impacting the national yeah, debt yeah, now, it's, it's, and so we'll probably it's, never get paid. University off. education is. It'd be very interesting to, to find out what the private discussions about university expansion uh, contained, and when the when the, when the, the necessary minutes are finally revealed. But uh, I've known civil servants who described it as the raising of the school leaving age to twenty one, and basically to cover up youth unemployment. And what's more, to make the people experiencing it pay for their pay for their dole by borrowing the money and paying paying it back for the rest of their lives, it seems to me to be a sort of scam. And now they've all turned into businesses. Mm. Uh, the, in the, there are towns you go to in this country where where the the university is a major export business apart from anything else because of the foreign students. Yeah, absolutely. Pay, and the, the housing which is attached, and it's all based on borrowed money, and there's so much of what we do is based on borrowed money. I would favour having a much smaller university sector in which those who, who, who won places at university had full grants and had their fees paid, which is what the system which which is what it when used I, to be. When I, when yeah. I was at university, and quite right too. I mean, it, I, I have often felt that it was a bit much to ask school dinner ladies and postmen to, to pay for me being at university between 1970 and 1973 and what I mainly did. It was much as a moment, but I think I have paid much of that. So uh, I've got one, well, one child who's studying medicine and another one who wants to go and study medicine. Do you think the NHS is worth working for these days? I, I, look, it's, it's, it's a vacation if you're any good at it, then, then worth it. I think the, the NHS is, a, is, is both overpraised and overslandered. It has terrible things that are wrong with it, and it has things which are very right with it. I don't. When I lived in the Soviet Union, I tried to investigate the medical system, and that was one of the reasons why we always kept a spare can of petrol in the boot of the car, because ultimately, if there was a medical emergency, the thing to do was head for the airport and go to Helsinki. The Soviet medical system was a disaster unless you were a member of a very small elite and could use the, the, the elite hospitals. Uh, and although it was it was technically available to everyone, it was terrible. Uh, the often the skill of the doctors was great, but the post-operative care was appalling, and the, the levels of hygiene were dreadful, mm. and the availability of drugs was bad, and the availability mm. of equipment was bad. You begin to see a resemblance. And then when I lived in the United States, I lived next door to a, to a hospital. I went and spent a day there to find out how their system worked, and in many ways it was as inefficient. Uh, and and as uh, as profligate in the wrong way, and as hard on patients as the NHS can be. And I thought this is certainly that the the American private insurance system is certainly not superior to ours. I haven't looked uh, properly in detail, for instance, at the Canadian single payer system or some of the continental ones. But I think that it's the NHS has virtues. Uh, which need to be defended, but they, sh they should be defended by people who are also prepared to admit it has vices as well. Because it does. Mm -hmm. It can fail very badly. What it can do we be do? tremendously inefficient. Yeah. Uh, it can be tr tremendously sloppy. Uh, and it, 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 it also has had periods when it's been very unhygienic as well, which has yeah. caused yeah. big trouble. But I have to say, who would ever argue against anyone being a doctor? But the difficulty is, in terms of funding an NHS, uh, new drugs coming along, people living longer, um, there's just more people using it than ever before. Well, yes, but that's because the fundamental concept of the NHS as devised by the Labour government in the, in the 1940s was for a country wholly different to the one mm. we have now, where people uh, did jobs which were so hard that they exhausted people and broke their health. 
Mm. And what we had in Britain was huge numbers of people with occupational diseases which uh, which had broken their health, which needed to be treated and people mm. needed to be looked after. And now we don't have that. We have a completely different problem, which, we, which is often people living lifestyles which lead inevitably to uh, to, to diseases which, which could be avoidable. And it, it, the, the role of preventive medicine in modern Britain, when all that back-breaking work is gone, mm. Uh, is is very large, but how do you manage to spread the idea of preventive medicine uh, among the population? I don't know. And meanwhile, how do you pay for the service? As it well, exists? you can't. It will, if you let it, it will swallow the entire gross domestic product. Yeah. So yeah. you have to think seriously about about preventive pre- preventive medicine becoming much more of a part of it. But that's these are separate questions. What I object to is the, is, is, is the appropriation of the NHS by the Labour Party as if, as if only they could, yeah. could could save it, when in fact that on the occasions when they've had full control of it, they often haven't done all that much except well, pour money into I, it. I would gently point you to Wales again, but that's... Um, well, yeah, anyway, yeah. It's, it's... Nobody is going to argue against mercy uh, or, or taxes being spent on mercy. Yeah. They have to be. And everybody wants to know that if they fall seriously ill or are badly hurt in an accident, mm. someone will come. Mm. And quite right too. But there's, it's the bits beyond that that you have to worry about. Mm. But you can't, you can't ever have a serious argument about it if immediately any attempt to reform it is denounced as a, as mm. a stealth privatisation. Sometimes it is <coughs> stealth privatisation, I have to say. But it, sometimes it isn't. Yeah, and yeah. sometimes it's actually perfectly sensible reform. And, we, and I do think the idea of a non-political royal commission on it is not at all a bad one. Not at all bad. And perhaps on education too? No. No? Because it doesn't. Not at the moment, no. Because there is a you the the, the 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 whole of the education establishment has its mind closed against uh, selection viability, and the also the education industry has been oh, taken so. over by the academy. <laughs> The, so fix it and then take it away from government. The academy. Well, I, I think we, I think a lot more work has to be done on. on the, the, I, I, I do debates on on ground schools. Very occasionally, I can find people who are prepared to argue against me. Yeah. I, I tried, for instance, my old university, York, a few months ago, to have a debate at their debating society on ground schools. They spent <laughs> nine months trying to find somebody who'd come and debate against me. That's they interesting. Couldn't get anybody to come. Uh, which I take as a compliment because I've done debates with them before and I always completely and utterly send them reeling with a single fact which most of them don't know which is the it's it's it, it wasn't even the purpose of the Gurney Dixon report of I think 1954 mm. table J which you can find on the internet but it showed that approximately 65% of all pupils at grammar schools came from working class homes right can you name me a single good comprehensive which could even begin to burst yeah. that? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I was I was one of that sixty five. Yeah, well, it's yeah. uh, Wales had actually a very good. I'm assuming you were educated in Wales. No, a, a little place east of Wales called England. Uh, oh, okay. Because yeah. Wales had 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 more ground schools than most parts of England. Yeah. They were more yeah. they were more thickly concentrated there than they were in a lot of parts of England. There simply weren't enough of them. Yeah. But with Wales, there were, and this is part of the problem, one of the, why the problems developed. But anyway, yeah, I don't, I, I, it would be, I'd be worried. There are now so few people in this country in positions of power and influence who themselves be properly educated. I'd be very worried about a, a commission on education. And most of the elites in this country have worked out ways of avoiding for their own children the catastrophe. Mm, the well, exactly. So how do you then sort something like well, that? Well, I mean, probably, you probably don't. But I, I think that I, I think that when I first started arguing for the reintroduction of selection, I was told, come on, that's dead, that's a stone age, mm. nothing will ever happen. Now I find, after about 10 or 15 years of doing it, that quite a lot of people are prepared to take it seriously. The same, as with, the same as with the, the, the drug question. When I first started saying, look, the police are not enforcing the laws against possession and uh, cannabis is linked with mental illness. People say, oh, come on, you're making all this up. And now these things are both generally accepted in, in public discourse. So it, it get, these are things I'm prepared to take up. I can make mm. a difference in these, but mm. general politics, no. Do you think part of the reason that you couldn't find anybody to, to debate you is because they don't want to be seen on the wrong side of the debate? Because it might... Oh, I don't know. I, 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 I think that I've, I've successfully taken these people on a debate in the past, yeah. and perhaps they just don't want... The experience what, again. What, I mean, I, I'm just because what I'm touching on is what did you think of um, this a few weeks ago now, wasn't it? There was a, I think it was Oxford had announced that they were uh, launching a journal where scientists and others could, could publish anonymously. 
people I didn't who, see that. I'm afraid people who were, who were too worried about publishing in the mainstream for being vilified and and uh, how fascinating! I didn't see that. I yeah. have to look it up. Well, now. it's absolutely fascinating. The fact that so this is this is this this would it, be a peer reviewed yeah, journal, a peer reviewed nature, way, a peer reviewed journal where you can where you can publish anonymously, hmm. simply because there are a lot of people who didn't feel just like the MPs don't yeah. feel they can express their true opinion on certain matters couldn't publish material. Yeah, well, science is different, isn't it? Because science is, you're impelled. If you're, if you're a good scientist, yeah. you follow the truth wherever it takes you. You have to, because yeah. otherwise you cease to be a scientist. In politics, it's not the same. Mm. In politics, you can see that the truth is going to lead you to difficulties. <laughs> you curl away, mm. do something else. So everyone's getting older. That just happens naturally, but pe most, pe people yeah. are living longer. Yeah. Doesn't that mean that, uh, and generally speaking, people become more conservative with a small c as they get older? Not, not that I can see, no. No? I think that's stopped. No, you think that's stopped? I can think it's stopped, yeah. Okay. It's stopped. So, is, is there any hope for anything at all? Not temporarily, no. <laughs> hope, that hope, that hope lies where it has always been, in eternity. I still think, while you're here, not you, but while we're here, there's still that that impetus to get people doing something in the here and saying something in the here and now. Well, sure, but I... And you've got Twitter, you've got lots of other things, you've got Facebook, yeah, you've but got I lots say, of ways... You can, you can ameliorate uh, and you can fight against something so you can slow it down. But there's always, of course, there's always the danger of having any consequences. You may think you're achieving something when in fact you're not. Did you ever see the, the, the film Charlie Wilson's War? I don't think it's I about did. an American congressman who actually the man who arranged the, the oh, American Oh yes, I did. did. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. With, yeah, yeah, yeah. Aided by the yeah. Saudis in Afghanistan. Well, of course, he created the Mujahideen, yeah. and ultimately you can see where that leads. Uh, and there's a very good bit at the end where there's this guru who's asked about the life of the person, and at each point things look good, and, the guru, mm. and they say that's good, and the guru says, "Well, we'll see." And my view about all changes that appear to be for the better is we'll see. We'll see. It may not be as good as it looks. Unintended consequences are, are the plague of our lives because we don't have perfect knowledge. But I think, in spite of what you say, you are making a big contribution yourself and you are speaking up from Well, it's sweet of you to say so, but I don't, I think people, I think there are people who like to listen to what I say because yeah. they feel less lonely. <laughs> no, I know this is, this is the best the, in all my life. The best books I've read are, are, are not the ones that tell me something I didn't know, but the ones that tell me what I already knew, but say, say it better than I could put it myself. Uh, that's that's the, comforting the, in an There's a lot of way. there's a lot of uh, pleasure to be had in finding that you're not alone, uh, or if not pleasure, then at least relief. But that doesn't necessarily mean it takes you anywhere. I can't be a sort of Jordan Peterson type life guru saying here are 12 steps to happiness. No, no, but what you can do and what you do do is to say things that other people perhaps might not be willing or, or, or able to. Well, yes, except create. when I have no platform, in no. which case I can't say them. What? But even that in itself is saying something, I isn't know, it? I you know, know. Which is quite but good. It closes in, doesn't it? The, the, the people who are no platforming, people like me at, at, at yeah. alleged universities now, will yeah. be in government and the civil service and the law and the police in 10 years, and they'll be doing a lot more than no platforming by then, because they will believe completely that there are some things that shouldn't be said, and they will stop people from saying them, and it will become more common. But that this is, is coming. That is awful then, isn't it? Well, it is awful, yes, that but is it's, it's, it's already among us. And it, you, for most people, particularly people working in the public sector, it already exists. They have to be very careful. They have to toe a line. They cannot reveal what they do think about certain issues. And sometimes they have to publicly say that they think things that they don't think. And they support things, absolutely. And BBC, if you don't wear a particular lanyard, you could find yourself in trouble. I believe that may be so, yeah. yeah. But so there you are, we're, we're halfway well, into it. Halfway into it already. Yeah, I, uh, that, but then I would still say it's a free country. You can do yeah, and say, yeah, you know, yeah, still yeah, ideally yeah. it's a free country. You should be able to think what you think and do and say what you want to do well, and say. Of course you should be, but it's, it's, it, it's, whether you can or not depends. I'm a national newspaper columnist. Yeah. I'm freer to speak than most people. Yeah. But again, it just requires people standing up. And if enough, if enough people stand up and say a little thing when they get an opportunity, it might make a big difference. You say. Well, I don't see any possibility of it. I don't see it happening, but I'd like to see it. I'd like to see more people. Well, yes, but what you like and what will happen are two different things. Yeah. And you mustn't let wishful thinking guide your... Uh, your well, which why your your ideas about what will happen? No, no, next. but but it's why things like you know some of the books you've written, maybe things like the the abridged version of Gulag Archipelago. You know, people do need to read this stuff and look at where we are but, but, on but, the journey and but, think, 
Oh yeah, perhaps I'd better stand up. And well, say but, so. uh, the point, the other point that I should have made earlier is that is in, in deciding what to do is that as far as I'm telling the truth, yeah, is itself a good action, always. And so, if people say, "Well, what do you, what do you hope to achieve?" So, if if I've told the truth about something, then that was worth doing. Hmm. It doesn't. It, it, that, that, that's that's one of those things which is which is which is, is, is say judged against an eternal standard. If it's true, uh, and you've said it, then it was worth doing for its own sake. It had, needs no other justification. I think that's a good point to end. You gave us an hour. I think it's a bit more than an hour. Well, Petitions. Right. Thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs> okay, chaps. Um, I think we're good to go. Um, the recording. Uh, Mm. Focus right. So what I'll do. We're, we're relying on you to get the focus right, but I was, some of us don't care. We, we don't mind if it's wrong, soft, actually. as soft as you like. Soft, soft. <laughs> I mean, I do this for the thing, though, so I kind of feel. You've like got to do it properly. Right. Oh, so you, so you say, is, it, is the light hot or warm and things like that? Yeah. Like, and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. Who cares? You're like, I feel fine. <laughs> get on with it. <laughs>